Good morning, everybody. It's 12 o'clock noon, and my OCD says that means it's time to get started. Uh, my name is Brian Leland. I'm Associate Program Director of our Clinical Ethics Fellowship over at Fairbanks, and I am uh, pleased to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Michael Joe Hobson, who's talking with us today about exploring ethical dilemmas in pediatric ECMO. Um, I wanted to welcome everybody here and remind you guys that we are broadcasting this live to some remote centers, and thank you to them for joining us. Um, I will take... I will take this opportunity to ask you to silence cell phones and pagers, and if you do need to answer those, if you'd be so kind as to step out when you do so. Um, if you are in the ROC, the evaluations for today are going to be done electronically. Excuse me. And the, they will close at 5 p.m. today, so make sure that you... 5 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, so make sure you get that done so that you can get your CME credit. Um, and then at the very end of the presentation, if you're watching from a remote site, there'll be a slide that has a um, number that you can text if you have questions that you'd like to ask Dr. Hobson. So without further ado, Dr. Hobson is our presenter today. He is an Indiana native and went to Brownsburg High School, I think. Um, he did his pediatric residency training in Boston and then did a pediatric critical care fellowship in Cincinnati and then returned to us and we're very excited to have him. He is our medical director of the pediatric intensive care unit and also the director of our ECMO program here at Riley and I'm very excited to see his presentation. He always gives awesome, awesome lectures. So without further ado. All right, well, thank you, Brian, and the rest of the ethics team for having me here this afternoon. I'm excited to explore with you all a topic that can have many, many ethical quandaries, but oftentimes a scarcity of easy answers. And I thought it would be fitting to start with a quote from John Marshall, who is an adult trauma and critical care surgeon up in Toronto. And in describing the function of the modern ICU, Dr. Marshall writes, the response of the medical team staves off imminent death, but fundamentally shapes the subsequent evolution of a clinical status suspended between life and death. And this, this figurative suspension of sick children hanging in the balance between living and dying becomes exponentially magnified when they are supported with ECMO. So here's our agenda. We'll go through a brief description of ECMO and what the technology entails, talk about some of the difficulties in selecting patients for this very high-risk, resource-intense therapy. Informed consent for ECMO is true informed consent even possible? We'll talk a little bit about the dilemmas in stopping ECMO when patients don't recover. And then lastly, we'll finish up with a fascinating topic of ECMO and its potential role for organ donation. So what is ECMO? ECMO stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. You may see it described in some venues as extracorporeal life support. Regardless of the terminology, the basic physiology of the ECMO circuit is as follows. You are taking out deoxygenated venous blood from the patient's body, hence the term extracorporeal. As that blood travels through the ECMO circuit, carbon dioxide is removed, oxygen is added back to the blood, and that highly enriched oxygenated blood is returned to the patient. We have two specific types of ECMO, depending on where the oxygenated blood is being infused back into the patient. If that blood is returning to the venous system, we call this venovenous or simply VV ECMO, and this would be our modality of choice for patients who need respiratory support. In contrast, if the blood is returning into the arterial system, this is called venoarterial or VA ECMO, and this is what we would use to support a child with re refractory cardiac failure. The vascular access for ECMO requires large cannulas. You can see here the ECMO cannulas are placed in the cervical vessels within the child's neck. This is done at the bedside by our pediatric general surgeons. If you notice here, for a patient with venoarterial ECMO, there is a large cannula residing within the carotid artery, and that in and of itself confers about a 5 to 10% risk of stroke 
while patients are on ECMO. Another option is direct cannulation of the right atrium and the aorta. Not surprisingly, this is most commonly performed by our cardiothoracic surgeons at the time of cardiopulmonary bypass. This is an example of an ECMO circuit. These are run at the patient's bedside in all three of our ICUs here at Riley. And the, the ECMO circuit is managed 24 hours a day, seven days a week by our team of ECMO specialists. Our ECMO specialists here at Riley are critical care nurses who have been specially trained in the management of the ECMO circuit, but also the management of ECMO patients as well. If you dissect apart the ECMO circuit, here are the major components, and quickly we'll just kind of walk through the pathway of the patient's blood. So again, you are removing deoxygenated venous blood. That blood goes through the tubing of the ECMO circuit. There's a pump that propels the blood in the forward direction. Membrane oxygenator is where the gas exchange takes place. The blood gets worn back up, and then that oxygenated blood is returned back into the patient. Now, importantly, to keep the blood from clotting as it travels through the ECMO circuit, patients are systemically anticoagulated, typically with just a traditional heparin infusion. Without a doubt, in the present day, the greatest challenge in contemporary ECMO is this very delicate balance between preventing a thrombotic complication within the circuit or simply having the circuit clot off versus preventing a catastrophic hemorrhagic complication within our ECMO patients. The potential complications associated with ECMO are numerous and they are significant. Again, bleeding is going to be the number one cause of morbidity and mortality on ECMO. There are also thromboembolic phenomenon with stroke. There's a risk of cardiac perforation, limb ischemia, the development of DIC with subsequent multi-organ failure, acquiring a new infection, and then there are a whole host of mechanical complications as well. Probably one of the most distressing things to see at the bedside is the development of DIC, and when this occurs, the child's distal extremities get very discolored and dark, and it's hard for the families as well as the caregivers to observe this process. So what are the indications for ECMO? Really, in a broad sense, there are two. The first would be cardiac or respiratory failure that is refractory to conventional medical therapy. And so an example would be progressive respiratory failure with hypoxia that you can't correct despite maximizing mechanical ventilation. Another example might be refractory shock that doesn't improve with vasoactive infusions. Regardless of the scenario, quite simply, in these circumstances, without ECMO, the child will die. The second indication can be a bit more of a gray zone, and this is where potentially the toxicities of some of our therapies might actually outweigh their clinical benefit. And probably the most common example would be this concept of ventilator-induced lung injury in the setting of ARDS. ARDS is a pulmonary disorder that is characterized by progressive pulmonary inflammation. And sometimes when we are supporting children through ARDS, we are requiring higher and higher pressures on the ventilator to maintain the patient's ventilation and oxygenation. Sometimes we reach a point where those pressures on the ventilator are actually worsening the inflammation, and that might be our trigger point to say, okay, let's transition to ECMO, come down on our ventilator support, and let the child's lungs rest and recover. Here at Riley, again, ECMO is going to be performed in all three of our intensive care units, and you can see from the list that we use it to support children through a wide variety of diseases. On average, in our institution, we usually have 30 to 40 ECMO runs per year. 
In terms of ECMO outcomes, one of the real difficulties right now is that there are almost no clinical trials that compare the use of ECMO to conventional medical therapy. And so what we really have to rely upon right now is survival data that's reported nationally. And you can see we break this down by age group as well as diagnosis. If you specifically look at neonatal and pediatric respiratory failure. When kids get sick enough with progressive respiratory diseases to require ECMO, nationally sur survival is greater than 50%. And so with this survival data in mind, ECMO has really become the standard of care in the pediatric critical care community for refractory respiratory failure. This graph depicts the growth of ECMO over the past two and a half decades. And as you can see from the graph, that it, it is being used more and more commonly in the pediatric and adult critical care communities. You see kind of a spike and an abrupt rise in 2009. Does anybody remember what that might be from? It was back with the, uh, the H1N1 pandemic and the uh, the adult critical care community got a lot of very sick adults through that pandemic with ECMO, and the use of ECMO in the adult critical care setting has risen ever since. And then lastly, this is just a reminder that there are a host of other mechanical circulatory support devices beyond ECMO. What I've shown here are a variety of ventricular assist devices these are long-term circulatory devices used to support children with um, ongoing heart failure. The main difference between these devices and ECMO is that these kids are often extubated, awake and alert, while they're awaiting recovery or transplant. That being said, much of the ethical principles that we're about to discuss with regard to ECMO can be applied to these devices as well. All right. So patient selection. So how do we decide which patients are suitable candidates for ECMO? And so as it relates to the principle of beneficence, ECMO ultimately should function for the good of the patient. Despite all of its risk of significant complications, ultimately the medical team deems that the benefit of ECMO for the child outweighs the risk of these complications. To take it a step further, however, we can't simply view ECMO as prohibiting death or preventing death. And so in that framework, we shouldn't really view ECMO as an end in and of itself, but it has to serve as a bridge to a destination. And so possible destinations would be the patient recovers from their acute illness. That is all, that is what we all hope for. If not, perhaps, they are a candidate for a heart or lung transplant. ECMO can be an acute bridge for a more longer term ventricular assist device. And in pediatrics, a ventricular assist device then can become a bridge to transplant. There are some instances where ECMO functionally serves as a bridge to diagnosis or as a bridge to decision. So what does that look like? I think a common example would be that a child comes in with progressive respiratory failure that we think is due to an infectious etiology. However, we're still waiting for our bacterial cultures, we're still waiting for our viral PCRs, and in the meantime, the child gets worse, we support them with ECMO, hopefully a couple days later, we have an answer in terms of our diagnosis and a therapeutic plan thereafter. Who's the ideal ECMO patient? Well, ideally, the patient has a known reversible illness. They're relatively healthy before their acute illness. Single organ failure, so isolated to the lungs or heart. Ideally, these children are neurologically intact before ECMO. And again, because of that risk for heparinization, a minimal bleeding risk. How often do our children actually fit these criteria? It's probably only around 20 to 25% of the time. This is a list of absolute and relative contraindications to extracorporeal support when I began my critical care fellowship about nine years ago. 
scanning the list, you can see a couple of them make sense and that they're related to the risk of bleeding with heparin. But then further down, you can see that others relate more to the status of the patient's immune system or a particular virulent infection. And then in these instances, the reported survival is pretty low. And then interestingly, at the very bottom of the list is significant developmental delay. Importantly, this is a list of historical contraindications. And in fact, if you look at our ECMO patients here at Riley over the past five years, we've supported kids with almost all of these contraindications, and many of them have survived and had pretty good outcomes. So let's take it a step further with a case. So a five-month-old girl with trisomy 18 is admitted to our hospital and undergoes repair of her ventricular septal defect. Her sternum is closed intraoperatively. Post-op, she comes up to the cardiac ICU on the ventilator, and over the subsequent 24 hours, she develops progressive low cardiac output syndrome, hypotension, and worsening organ dysfunction. Now, because this girl's sternum was closed intraoperatively, the cardiac ICU and cardiac surgical teams consult pediatric general surgery for ECMO cannulation via her cervical vessels. And so what are some ethical considerations as it relates, relates to this child? Perhaps the pediatric general surgery team comes on the scene and says, you know what, with this girl having trisomy 18, her risk of mortality at the end of her first year of life is 90%, and in the grand scheme of things, the risk of ECMO complications outweigh their benefit. On the flip side of the argument, maybe the cardiac team is saying, ECMO is an established modality used to support patients who have expected post-op complications, of which low cardiac output syndrome is one. We've already invested a lot of resources to bring this child into our facility and repair her cardiac defect, and as such, ECMO should be viewed as no, no different than any other modality that we use to support children in their post-operative recovery, including ventilator, ICU resources, etc. And so what are kind of the uh, competing views then as it relates to this case? The historical or kind of the old school approach to ECMO was that people said, you know what, ECMO is costly, it utilizes a lot of resources, perhaps we should reserve this for previously healthy patients who we can quote unquote salvage back to a normal quality of life. The newer trend in pediatric critical care is that there are actually few conditions that should be viewed as completely incompatible with ECMO. Maybe incurable cancer, maybe a lethal chromosomal abnormality, but by and large, comorbidities should not shy us away for ECMO. And this relates to the principle of justice, ensuring the fair and equitable treatment of all patients, including kids with Down syndrome, metabolic disorders, etc. Again, the caveat being that in those scenarios, ECMO is serving as a bridge to recovery or to transplant. This is some data from the Extracorporeal Life Support Organization that shows the use of ECMO for children with respiratory failure. Draw your attention to the black bars at the bottom of the graph. These are the number of children going on ECMO with significant under, underlying medical conditions and you can see that those numbers are continuing to increase. If you look at the top part of the graph that depicts survival, not surprising, survival is worse for kids with comorbidities compared to those who are previously healthy. A huge challenge as it relates to patient selection and counseling families is the immense amount of uncertainty before ECMO commences uncertainty regarding prognosis and chances of survival. How long are they going to be on ECMO? How long are they going to be in the hospital? If they survive to discharge, what is life going to look like at home? Do they have significant muscle weakness? Do they require a tracheostomy and long-term mechanical ventilation at home? What are their risk of complications, bleeding, stroke, etc.? And then how does the impact of underlying medical conditions play into our decision making? I found this to be an interesting paper written by 
Nancy Roden in the mid 1980s. Um, Nancy Roden is a lawyer at the Ohio State University and she outlines some strategies that are utilized by neonatologists who are taking care of newborn babies with very significant diagnoses that carried with them very poor, um, a very poor prognosis. And so I tried to extrapolate some of these uh, ethical or decision-making strategies to the ECMO world. And so the first strategy is wait until certainty or what's called the maximum strategy. And with this strategy, ECMO was started for most patients and continued until we have a reasonable amount of certainty about the patient's outcome. Advantages with this approach, all patients' right to life is respected. We are avoiding deaths who, we are avoiding the deaths of patients who otherwise um, would not have survived without ECMO. And then at the end of the day, the medical team is not leaving the hospital wondering in the back of their mind, could this child have survived had we pulled the trigger and tried ECMO? Pitfalls here, this strategy does not account for potential pain and suffering inflicted on the patient. What about complications? It does not account for a complication leading to a severe disability if the child survives ECMO. And then lastly, there's not really a role in this approach for involving the family in the decision-making process. At the opposite end of the spectrum is the statistical prognostic strategy. And in this approach, patients who come in and have a poor prognosis, ECMO is withheld from all of these patients. The proposed advantages to this approach is that you're going to minimize the number of children who have pain and suffering. You're going to minimize the number of children who have a complication and a subsequent disability. On the flip side, though, is that you may miss a handful of kids who actually beat the odds and do quite well. Again, like the, the first strategy, the statistical prognostic strategy lacks involvement of the family. And then what is the, what is the definition of a cutoff point for a poor prognosis? Is it 50% survival? Is it 40%? What about 35%? I think if it were my child coming in with respiratory failure and they had a one in three chance of survival with ECMO, I think I would advocate to give it a try. And then lastly, reliance on data that may be inaccurate or scarce. And that certainly is the case for the ECMO community right now, just given the fact that it's a technology that is not deployed with um, any degree of regularity, and we certainly don't have robust numbers to help with our, um, to help or to guide our current practice. Our current sources of data, um, there is the extracorporeal life support registry that is located up in Ann Arbor, Michigan. This has crude information regarding the outcomes of various patient populations. In terms of the ECMO medical literature, we're really limited right now to mostly single center retrospective studies. So again, not a large number of robust clinical trials by which to make meaningful decisions. And then interestingly, over the past couple years, there have been a couple of prediction models that have been formulated. And so the idea here is that you take your patient's pre-ECMO variables, plug them into one of these prediction models, and they help you formulate a prognosis for your particular patient. So let's see how those prediction models might play out. This is a patient who is very near and dear to my heart. I admitted her about halfway through my fellowship um, one night when I was on call. She at the time was four month old girl who came in with respiratory distress. She got intubated fairly quickly. By PICU day number two, she had progressive ARDS and transitioned from our conventional ventilator over to the oscillator. And then a couple days later was diagnosed with pertussis. And if you know anything about pertussis, this is an infection that can be characterized by very volatile pulmonary hypertension. And that was the case for this baby. She developed refractory cardiac failure. And by ICU day number five, it was looking like she was almost certainly going to die. So the question comes up then, well, what would be her chances with ECMO? 
And so now you can turn off Pandora and go onto the Peed Rescuer site, plug in the baby's pre-ECMO variables and the prediction model. And by the way, this prediction model functions better than any of our current severity of illness scores that we use commonly in the ICU. So it's been pretty reasonably validated from that standpoint. Anyway, you put in her pre-ECMO variables and the PED rescuer model would suggest that this child's predicted mortality on ECMO would be 81%. And so if you utilize the statistical prognostic strategy that's outlined in Roden's paper, with a 19% chance of survival, you are not offering ECMO, you are conveying your sympathy to the family, and you're moving on to the next patient. Fortunately, this girl had other ideas, and here she is about eight months after she left the hospital, neurologically intact, weaning off her supplemental oxygen. So then, what does Roden deem as the best approach? And what she would advocate for in that manuscript is what's called the individualized prognostic strategy. With this strategy, ECMO is started for almost all patients, but then you evaluate its utility at certain, interval, certain intervals of time. So the advantage here is that going on ECMO, everybody acknowledges that there's going to be some degree of uncertainty regard, regarding the patient's outcome. Because you are evaluating the appropriateness of ECMO at certain intervals, perhaps you can avoid prolonged and unnecessary suffering. Unlike the previous two approaches, this one's nice because the medical team and the patient's family are working together to, to make a collaborative decision. And then lastly, this approach acknowledges that the life of these children has implicit value, but at the same time, in some instances, perhaps the more compassionate thing to do would be to withdraw ECMO support. I just included this um, to show you that this is, this is kind of my own personal flow sheet that I sometimes will utilize as a framework when we are discussing heading down the ECMO path. And it just, I think, is a good illustration of how complex and interrelated some of these factors may be. At the other end of the journey is terminating ECMO. So when and why might we have to stop this modality? Sometimes it's really easy. Our patient has recovered. They've moved on to transplant. Perhaps they've suffered from some terminal complication like progressing to brain death after a massive stroke. But on occasion, there are gray zones where, again, uncertainty comes into play. A common dilemma that we face is declaring a disease process irreversible. And in those situations, ECMO has now become a bridge to nowhere. A real challenge in these circumstances is how long do you actually wait to make this declaration? And so with that in mind, this was a study that looked at survival for children with respiratory failure who required ECMO support. And now the, uh, the average length for pediatric respiratory failure on ECMO is around 10 to 14 days. And you can see that if you stay within that two-week ballpark, survival is going to stay above 50%. Beyond three weeks, survival is significantly reduced, but it's not zero. And in fact, there was a, a recent case report of a man who was supported with venovenous ECMO for 265 days before he uh, went on to get a successful lung transplant. The next gray zone is what I refer to as the bleeding cycle. So consider this scenario. So a three-year-old girl with pneumonia and associated empyema is admitted to the hospital. Despite having her pleural effusion evacuated with a chest tube, she goes on to develop sepsis, ARDS, pulmonary inflammation, and fluid overload. She gets worse to the point that we decide to support her with ECMO. ECMO, again, requires anticoagulation with heparin, and unfortunately, heparinization led to persistent bleeding from her chest tube. In efforts to stop the bleeding, this child receives multiple blood product transfusions. She has a couple of surgical interventions, 
and the transfusions and her operations lead to more pulmonary inflammation, more fluid overload. She remains dependent upon ECMO, which depends upon heparin, which leads to more bleeding, and this cycle spirals downward. And at some point, we need to step back and ask ourselves, at what point have we lost non-maleficence? And so with regard to non-maleficence in ECMO, if ECMO is causing refractory bleeding, if it's causing DIC and multiple organ dysfunction, it's really no longer of any benefit to the patient, and we should view stopping ECMO as justifiable. Importantly in this analysis, we always need to include any perceived pain and suffering um, that is being incurred by the child. And then the final gray zone is futility. So when is continuing ECMO not actually improving the patient's medical condition, and perhaps it might be bringing about more patient suffering. The three most common examples of futility on ECMO that's cited in the literature would be progressive multi-organ failure, a severe brain injury, or irreversibility of disease slash loss of transplant status. So we'll just take a quick look of an example of a child with a severe brain injury. So a two-year-old boy with viral myocarditis is supported with VA ECMO via cervical cannulation. On day number four, his right pupil becomes fixed and dilated. You get a head CT that shows a large MCA stroke with massive cerebral edema. Gradually, you're starting to see some improvement in his heart function, but not yet to the point that he's ready to come off ECMO. Over the subsequent week, all you're seeing on bedside neurologic exam is breathing above the ventilator and posturing in response to stimulation. The medical team recommends withdrawal of ECMO support due to his neurologic status. This really gets to the heart of the ongoing debate of quality of life versus quantity of life or sanctity of life. This is certainly not an issue that is unique to ECMO. This is something that we deal with in the ICU pretty commonly. The other consideration is this possibly a prejudicial or subjective view to compare the future of this child with a disability to those who are otherwise healthy children. Loss of transplant status. So in this scenario, a 17-year-old girl with end-stage cystic fibrosis has been dependent upon VV ECMO for two months while awaiting lung transplant. She's currently awake and alert, extubated, and walking around the ICU on ECMO. Unfortunately, she now has pneumonia with a multi-drug multi resistant bacteria that you can't clear with antibiotics. In the midst of this infection, she's developed renal failure and poor nutritional status, and sadly, she is no longer considered a transplant candidate. The ICU consults the ethics team who recommends withdrawal of ECMO due to its utility. The family hears about that, and they threaten to sue the hospital if ECMO is removed. So first thing, Patient awake and alert, extubated, walking around the ICU on ECMO. Is this fake news or does this actually happen? And in fact, in some transplant centers, some lung transplant centers, it's been shown that if you have your patients with chronic respiratory failure on VV ECMO, if you can get these patients up, walking around the unit, working with physical therapy and maintaining some degree of muscle strength, their post-transplant outcomes are actually better. They have fewer complications, they get off the ventilator faster, they leave the hospital faster. All right, so back to the patient who is now awake, alert, alive, and dependent upon ECMO. Many of us will recognize that withholding and withdrawing therapies are ethically equivalent. So if this girl, for example, if she was not a transplant candidate at the beginning of her illness, we would not have offered her ECMO. And now, in the present time, if she is no longer a transplant candidate, ECMO should not be confirmed. And so withholding and withdrawing ECMO are ethically equivalent, but psychologically, these two things feel very differently to us. Why might that be the case? Well, you can imagine after two months in our ICU, the medical team has developed a very intimate relationship with this patient and her family. The bonds of trust are fairly deep. 
you are telling this 17-year-old young lady that you're going to have to remove the ECMO cannulas, and her response is emotional distress and anxiety, and then unilaterally removing ECMO without patient permission. We do not routinely do this with breathing tubes and mechanical ventilation. That's probably a whole nother discussion if we should, but currently we do not commonly do this with ventilation. Why should we view ECMO as any different? And then lastly, the last um, example of futility would be progressive multi-organ failure. And I think seeing children develop limb ischemia and diffuse body edema bleeding from their nose and mouth. This is really a significant cause of moral distress for the medical team, particularly the um, critical care nurses and our ECMO specialist who are at the bedside around the clock. All right, do not resuscitate on ECMO. I think this is a, this is a unique concept and one that is sometimes kind of hard to wrap uh, our brains around. So the idea here is that ECMO is ongoing resuscitation. And while you have a patient on ECMO, it's very possible that their heart could become progressively more bradycardic and actually progress into a systole. However, with the ECMO circuit continuing to function, there's oxygenated blood going round and round and keeping the tissues and the organs alive. And so what is currently recommended in the ethical literature is to actually separate DNR status into two distinct components. The first is the traditional patient DNR status, what you would commonly think of. So you're not going to perform chest compressions. You're not going to restart the heart with electricity. If they have hypotension, you're not going to turn up the epinephrine infusion. The second component would be an actually distinct circuit DNR status. So the example here would be an instance where the ECMO circuit became non-functional. And probably the most common example of that would be that the ECMO circuit clots off. Well, with, a, with an ECMO circuit DNR status, there would be an agreement that in the event that the ECMO circuit clots off, we are not going to replace that with a new functional ECMO circuit. ECMO and informed consent. Does true informed consent actually exist when we are using ECMO to save a child's life? And as many of you know, the um, process of informed consent is closely tied to the ethical principle of autonomy. This means that the patient or their surrogate is knowledgeable about the therapeutic options. They are competent to make these decisions. The medical team has provided them sub sufficient information. And then lastly, the decision makers are free from any external pressures or any external constraints. So what should it look like? Again, patients are competent. We sit down with the family and we talk about the current clinical state of the child. We talk about the risk and benefits of ECMO. We outline potential outcomes, including the possibility of non-recovery. And at the end of that discussion, we give our formal recommendation as the medical provider. The family voices understanding of the risk and benefits and their, op and their options, and they voluntarily consent for ECMO. What's recommended is that the more complex the medical condition or treatment, the longer and more complex the education and conversation have to be. This is what informed consent should, like, should look like. Functionally, what actually happens? Well, we are in the child's room in the ICU. We are resuscitating them. We are trying to gain stability. The patient's family is waiting for us out in the quiet room. One of us runs out of the ICU into the quiet room, meets the family, and the conversation goes something like this. Johnny's pneumonia is getting worse. We're having trouble keeping up his oxygen numbers with the ventilator, and because of the lack of oxygen, his heart's having trouble. Really, the next step and all that we have left to support him is a heart-lung bypass machine called ECMO. And then you outline all the potential complications, surgical complications, bleeding complications, risk of stroke, uh, 
You tell them that most children who go on ECMO for pneumonia will need the machine for about two weeks, but there's a chance that he might not recover and will have to take the machine away. The parents really stop hearing you about there. They hear, my baby's about to die, you have a machine that may save their life, just please go back in the room and save my baby. So why is informed consent hard in these scenarios? Again, complex and unfamiliar technology. At the time of ECMO cannulation, sometimes we don't have a diagnosis. There's uncertainty about the prognosis. Due to clinical instability, we don't often have a lot of time to sit down and have very prolonged or detailed discussions. And then perhaps our own urgency may, may inadvertently serve as kind of an external pressure on the family. Issues of informed consent can sometimes become magnified in situations involving what is called extracorporeal cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or eCPR. eCPR, um, a common scenario would be a child comes into the hospital, they suffer a cardiac arrest, and you don't have return of circulation with chest compressions and doses of epinephrine, and so you rapidly mobilize ECMO to restore perfusion to the child. How does eCPR compare to conventional CPR? Well, if you look at survival, survival utilizing eCPR is almost double, and there also is a benefit in terms of long-term neurologic outcome. With these outcomes utilizing eCPR, some people wonder whether early eCPR use for cardiac arrest in the ICU setting should become the new standard of care. There are actually some countries in the world that are taking eCPR a step further, and they're actually cannulating patients for ECMO at the scene of cardiac arrest before bringing them into the hospital. And so you collapse at the grocery store, you suffer a V-fib arrest crossing the street, maybe a child in the neighborhood drowns in the local pond. In all of these examples, the goal is to get stability then and there at the time with ECMO, and then transfer the patient into the, into the hospital. With regard to eCPR, there are certainly some issues as it relates to informed consent. As an invasive procedure, there's the potential for unnecessary and prolonged suffering. What if the patient had a cardiac arrest from an irreversible etiology? You've now placed them on ECMO and interrupted that dying process. You've deprived this patient the opportunity to die a peaceful and dignified death. If you think about Conventional CPR, typically it's the medical team that decides when to stop chest compressions. In the setting of eCPR, you've now brought the family into that decision making and asking them to have to decide when to turn off ECMO for their patient or for their family member. Uncertain criteria right now. We do know in the pediatric literature that children who have an underlying cardiac disease typically do better with eCPR than those with progressive respiratory failure. The adult ECMO community is trying to figure out how elderly is too old for eCPR, how long of a time of chest compressions is too long for eCPR. So a lot of question marks right now. And then, yes, while survival rates are better, are we unnecessarily creating a higher percentage of patients who survive with a persistent vegetative state? As a summation, this is the best, I think the best and most concise recommendations with regard to the ethical issues that surround ECMO. It comes from a group in Australia that does a lot of ECMO, and they really have been pushing the envelope in terms of some ECMO-specific arenas. So their recommendations, number one, ECMO centers should have written guidelines regarding indications and contraindications to help with some of these issues around patient selection. Specifically, as it relates to the consent process, we need to always include the potential need to withdraw ECMO in cases of futility. If you protocolize some of your care, can you reduce complications? Number four, engage and update family members regularly. 
This is something that I think we do fairly well here in our ICUs. We practice family-centered care. We're rounding on our ECMO patients two times a day, sometimes three, and these are really opportunities to engage the patient's families at the bedside, update them about progress, complications, things that we're worried about. They can ask questions at that time and address uh, concerns as well. Number five, so duration. When's a reasonable amount of time to declare a disease process irreversible? Their recommendation is that for cardiac failure, a typical VA ECMO run should be about two to three weeks. For respiratory failure, you can extend that interval out to two to three months. Regardless, their recommendation is that if you are on ECMO for four to seven weeks, your critical care group really should kind of step back and carefully scrutinizing, should carefully scrutinize the decision to extend ECMO beyond that four to seven week time period. And then lastly, if recovery is not possible and the child dies, you need to have um, support structures in place to help the family through the grieving process. Here at Riley, we have fantastic resources with social work, our chaplains, terrific palliative care team, et cetera. And then for the medical care team who have taken care of this child over a potential two to four week period, a time of debriefing for all the, all the staff who are involved in their care. I wanted to finish with just kind of a brief, brief overview of ECMO and its possible role in the organ donation process. I think this is a, uh, a topic that may raise a few eyebrows. So um, first is kind of some background. In the ICU, there are two potential routes by which a patient can become an organ donor. The first route would be via the brain death pathway, and this is typically what it looks like. So you have a patient coming into the ICU after some type of catastrophic neurologic injury whether that be due to trauma, hypoxia, et cetera. We have a uh, pretty, pretty, pretty rigid process for diagnosing brain death, and when patients meet those criteria, they are not only declared brain dead, but they are also at that time declared clinically and legally dead as well. Many families, upon um, the diagnosis of brain death will consent to the organ donation process and thereafter the child's body remains in the ICU for about two to three days and is now under the care of the organ procurement organization. During that two to three day time period there is various testing that evaluates the suitability of the organs for transplant. The child's body remains on the ventilator and often uh, the blood pressure is supported with various medications. Once all of the testing is complete, the child's body is taken to the operating room for organ procurement. This is a true case of a, uh, a teenage boy that I took care of in our burn unit a uh, couple winters ago. So he was a 15-year-old boy who suffered an anoxic brain injury after being trapped in a house fire. He's declared brain dead on ICU day number three, and his family consents to organ donation. He is eligible to donate abdominal organs, so kidneys, intestines, pancreas, and liver. However, in the process of organ evaluation, he has progressive hypoxia from ARDS that is secondary to a smoke inhalational injury. His heart does not tolerate the hypoxia there is a refractory cardiac arrest and he no longer can donate um, his organs. And so at the end of this day, I sat back and asked myself, could we have, should we have utilized ECMO to reverse the hypoxia and preserve organ function? And the question really is, well, was this patient kind of an isolated fluke or is this a real problem? The reality is that 15% of organs for donation are lost due to donor clinical instability. And this has given rise to this concept of organ preserving ECMO, which is simply using ECMO to preserve organ suitability for subsequent transplant. 
there are certain parameters that are recommended to be in place to make this a very clean and transparent process. First, the patient has to be declared brain dead. Second, the patient consents for organ donation. And then, in the event that the, the patient's body would require ECMO, it's recommended that you obtain a separate consent specifically for ECMO, given that it lies kind of outside the normal organ, donating, organ donation process. Are there ethical concerns with organ preserving ECMO? Some people worry that this is an invasive procedure, but remember these patients are brain dead and as such they cannot feel pain or suffering. Putting the ECMO cannulas in the neck into the cervical vessels, there is a concern of loss of bodily integrity, but this is deemed to be a fairly minor incision compared to the very large incision that is going to be um, performed at the time of organ procurement. What do you lose if ECMO is not deployed in these circumstances? In the midst of a very horrible and tragic event for the family, the one silver lining sometimes is their loved one's ability to donate organs and help out the life of another child and kind of leave a lasting legacy for their own loved one. Likewise, if you think about how many kids are out in the community with chronic uh, dialysis for renal failure, kids with chronic ascites for liver failure, kids in our hospital with chronic heart failure, the quality and perhaps quantity of lives for that patient population is diminished without ECMO as well. And then lastly, in terms of Resource utilization, yes, um, ECMO does require a lot of resources, including um, OR teams, surgical teams. The ECMO equipment is expensive. You're talking about blood product utilization. But in the grand scheme of things, those resources are fairly minute in comparison to the entire organ donation process. The second path to organ donation is what's referred to as donation after circulatory death, or simply DCD. Here, a patient comes in with a catastrophic neurologic injury, but they don't quite progress to brain death. And so, in many instances, these patients have a very guarded prognosis. They have a very poor neurologic exam and the family wishes to withdraw life-sustaining therapies. And commonly, in the midst of those discussions, they will inquire about organ donation. And so, with the DCD process, the patient is taken um, downstairs into a room adjacent to the operating rooms. Mechanical ventilation is disconnected. Blood pressure medications are stopped. And there is an hour period in which the patient must pass away in order to be eligible to donate organs. The medical team is at the patient's bedside, and when they see that there has been cessation of circulation, there's a five-minute period of observation, and then they declare the patient dead. Upon that declaration, the child's body is taken to the operating room for um, subsequent organ donation. Now, the problem, the clinical problem associated with DCD is that there is potentially a 65-minute time frame where the organs um, are in the uh, clinical situation of hypotension and hypoxia. And what's been described in the adult transplant literature um, as it relates first to kidney transplant, the longer the ischemic time, the longer it takes for these kidneys to function in the acute post-transplant period. The stakes are a little bit higher with regard to liver transplant. We know that longer ischemic times for livers that are transplanted means a higher chance of acute graft dysfunction, and that those events can, or those complications can actually be associated with a high percentage of uh, patient mortality. And then down the road, if patients do well and leave the hospital, they still are at risk for biliary complications, things like biliary strictures, et cetera. And so enter EDCD. This is using ECMO to provide 
blood flow to the organs, minimize ischemia time, and ultimately improve the chance that the organs will function better for their recipients. Worldwide, there are right now only five adult transplant centers that perform EDCD. Two of them are fairly close to us. Um, one is up in Ann Arbor and the other is in Detroit. And this is their, their setup. So for their patients, they cannulate for ECMO through the femoral vessels. And so the oxygenated blood delivered from the ECMO circuit travels upward through the aorta and can, per, and can perfuse the kidneys, the liver, et cetera. So you look at this and you wonder, hmm, what if that oxygenated blood makes its way to the heart and the heart starts beating again? Or what if the oxygen makes its way to the patient's brain and they wake up? That would be a bit of a dilemma, wouldn't it? And so what they do is through the other femoral artery, a catheter is inserted and they blow up this supradiaphragmatic balloon thereby blocking blood flow to the coronary and cerebral circulations. Interestingly, there's a couple different patterns of timing for ECMO cannulation. Some centers, three centers outside of the United States, will cannulate these patients for ECMO up in the ICU before the DCD process actually commences. In Ann Arbor and Detroit, they are cannulating for ECMO once the DCD process is complete and the patient um, has died. So ethical considerations. Certainly the strategy of pre-mortem cannulation, these patients are not dead and as such they can feel pain. What if you go downstairs for the DCD process and the patient doesn't die? You've thus subject that, subjected that patient to unnecessary procedures you perhaps have unjustly modified their process of dying. There was a case report in France of the supradiaphragmatic balloon not functioning. That patient's brain got a bolus of oxygen during the organ procurement process and the patient kind of gasped. And you can imagine that was quite distressing for the OR team at the time. On the flip side of the argument, if the donor's wish is to maximize the health of the recipient, Perhaps EDCD is the means by which to meet that end. And then lastly, kind of a larger philosophical question, if cessation of circulation is reversible, has death even occurred? I just wanted to finish up. So remember pre-hospital ECMO. Well, there are some, some, or some countries in the world, mainly in Eastern Asia. Taiwan is probably the most uh, famous example where there is a huge shortage for organs for transplant. And so in those countries, if a citizen has a cardiac arrest out in the community, EMS and the ECMO team arrives, they cannulate for ECMO at the scene, you are brought to the hospital on ECMO, you're admitted to the ICU, where you're given about three or four days to recover, and if you don't recover, you are taken to the operating room as an involuntary organ donor. So on that very eerie note, be careful where you've made your spring break plans, and thank you much. Are there questions? I'm so sorry. And for anyone who is outside of IU or from here at Rock, you can call to text 317-502-7621. Thank you, Lucia. Dr. Hobson, that was a fabulous presentation. You mentioned you had on your slide a list of recommendations for what ECMO Center should have with regard to informed consent. Can you speak to what Riley has in place with regard to the recommendations that you've made? Um, yeah, so the first, it's a great question, Lucia. The first recommendation is written guidelines regarding indications and contraindications. Um, the neonatal critical care community has pretty clear numeric guidelines in terms of severity of disease that would necessitate, necessitate transitioning to ECMO. In the pediatric critical care community, we do not have strict numeric criteria that say that your outcomes are better if you transition to ECMO at this point in time. 
Um, likewise, for cardiac failure, people are trying to look at various calculations to suggest that your outcome is better if you transition to ECMO before a certain degree of organ dysfunction ensues. So the, I think that's a long way of saying in terms of written guidelines, we don't have specific guidelines in pediatric critical care right now. I think one of the things that we as a group do very well knowing that we don't have hard and fast medical literature to guide our practice and knowing that particularly at this hospital there's a lot of kids with um, significant comorbidities. Our current practice is if you are on service in the ICU and considering ECMO support for a child, um, our practice is to consult uh, another attending intensivist in our group and have those discussions. Sometimes it's three or four people. Um, on the flip side would be we have a child who's got progressive clinical deterioration and here's a contraindication to ECMO. I'm going to consult another one of my colleagues and seek their agreement as well. Um, really early on in your presentation, you mentioned that you, and you've mentioned it again, that you don't have a lot of data and you measure outcomes by hospital discharge primarily? So, primarily. So what's reported up to the ELSO registry in, Arbor, in Ann Arbor are the two primary outcomes are um, survival off ECMO. And so that's more indicative in my mind of did you have some type of complication that led to this patient not even being able to come off ECMO? And then the second marker is survival to hospital discharge. And I think that speaks more to um, maybe patient selection. If, if you have a lot of patients with significant comorbidities and maybe they're coming off ECMO but ultimately not recovering from their disease. So those are right now the two main outcomes that we look at. That being said, um, certainly walking out of the hospital versus going home on mechanical ventilation with the tracheostomy tube versus having some type of significant stroke, those are all very different patients. But in the national registry, those are all going to get registered as survival to hospital discharge. So it's a very, people openly recognize it. Our outcome data collection right now is fairly limited. Do and so you know, it's, I'm sorry, do you know if they're working on collecting more data about long-term outcomes? Is that something that's... Yeah, so actually, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Dr. Bill Engel, who is one of our neonatologists, he and Dr. Karen West, who um, retired from our surgery department last year, they actually um, established Riley's ECMO um, program back in 1987. And... Dr. ECMO, um, or doc, Dr. Engel, he could be called Dr. ECMO. Um, Dr. Engel, one of his academic interests is long-term outcomes of survivors of neonatal ECMO. And so he has contacted patients that he took care of back in the 80s and 90s. And so these are now um, young adult patients who survived ECMO in the neonatal period. And he, um, he's basically, it's kind of a qualitative study looking at what is life like for these ECMO survivors. And the, the common denominator in terms of long-term morbidity is it seems like these patients have a fair amount of um, like ADHD, learning disabilities, things like that. Yeah. Thank you. So I am aware of the time. Your colleague at West has asked a question through the phone, so I am aware of the time. So I'm going to go ahead and close out, but I will give you Mandy's question, and you can address oh, Mandy directly. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's one of the things that 
there's many questions about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I will email you that and get you two connected. Sounds good. So. Lovely. Thanks. Thanks. Do I need to do anything to log off here? Uh, hey, how are you? No, I'm so so my I don't know so my background coming over here is here, but I I did open it. Yeah. You know, way back when I have no idea how old you are, but I think it was a long time ago. Like in the in the mid eighties, like okay. you know, like before you guys had an ethanol thing that I would use like one of the first ethanol things in DC. And so there were some events that were considered catastrophic and you just got like massive bleed yeah. like a like a total bleed. 